Hello, everyone. Welcome to Artist Loft 101. Tonal shading with and without a ground. I'm your instructor, Adrian Hodge, and hopefully we've got some folks joining us who joined last week. If you missed last week's class, it is up on the Michael's YouTube channel and uh, archived on the website under previous classes and uh, fine art. You can find it pretty easily. And that first class was intro to graphite and um, drawing forms. And there, there's some stuff that we covered in last week's class that I'll be referring to tonight. So if you want to go back and watch the, the first class of so this entire series, the Artist Loft Drawing Series is going to be uh, spread out over the, the next year or so. And so if you're just joining, just think of this as if you just signed up for a drawing class. It's Drawing 101 in addition to um, Artist Loft 101 because we'll be using all Artist Loft supplies. I'm going to dive in pretty quick tonight. I see a lot of people are joining from all over the place. Hi from New Jersey, DC, uh, Austin, Texas, Baltimore, Florida. Awesome. Um, yeah, we've got a really great group tonight. I'm excited to have you all here. Um, we've got a lot to cover, so I'm going to dive right in. Um, but before I do that, I don't want to forget to um, encourage you to tag your work that you make with us tonight with the hashtags make it with Michaels or Michaels classes and follow me on Instagram. I'm on Instagram at Adrian Hodge art and uh, I'm a teaching artist based in Austin, Texas. I do a lot of drawing in my work that is mainly done with calligraphy ink. So do a lot of paintings that I sometimes consider to be drawings since I use a lot of drawing techniques only with paintbrushes and inks. And so if you want to follow me on Instagram and check that out, and I also do a lot of independent classes on my own, and I'm happy to be doing this Artist Loft series with Michaels. Okay, so uh, tonight we're going to be talking about tonal shading and we're going to do a couple of different techniques that you can do with uh, with tonal shading. We're going to be using a still life item. So you're going to want a piece of fruit, like a lemon or an apple or any still life object that you feel comfortable drawing, maybe a flower. I would stick to something organic, though. We're going to uh, be really focusing on some techniques avoiding um, linear perspective for a while here until about class eight or nine, and then we will switch to uh, talking about linear perspective, and then we'll start introducing more geometric forms. So uh, I'm going to be using the Artist Loft sketching pencils. I've got the, the set of 12 here, so all of the H's and B's, and if you're not familiar with the uh, HMB pencils and the numbers on the pencils. Go check out the class from last week. That's where I really broke down all of the different uh, letters and numbers on the pencils. We're also going to use a few tortillions or blending stumps tonight. Uh, you're going to want a kneaded eraser and a synthetic eraser, both so that you have a choice. And you're going to need some sketching paper. And I believe that is it. That was all on the supply list. And you want a tissue or a paper towel. So if you don't have those things ready, go ahead and grab those. Um, and if you have any questions, you can just drop them in the chat. Last week, I know I was a little more active with the chat than I'm going to be this, uh, this week, just because I've got a lot I want to cover. But Maddie is our moderator, and uh, she will be happy to pass along any questions that are reoccurring. So I was really enjoying chatting with you guys a lot last week, but I'm going to keep my eyes on my desk more this time. But I want to hear your questions. We'll so Adrian, oh, right, yeah. but before we dive into drawing, we have quite a few supplies of, or questions about the supplies. And a lot of people are asking if the needed eraser is really necessary or if they could just use regular erasers. 
Okay, yes. Uh, you can definitely just use the synthetic eraser. You just might see me using the kneaded eraser quite a bit, especially with the ground. So I'm going to be kind of twisting it up and making a point with it so I can erase into the ground and get some lighter values going. So if you've got one, great. If you don't, you can use the synthetic eraser just as well. Not just the same because they're not just the same, but you can definitely get by with the synthetic eraser. Oh, and also I um, might bust out these uh, woodless graphite pencils. And I forgot to mention that I have those and also the sanding paper block. Uh, those were underneath my paper there, but those were two other supplies I wanted you to have. Uh, so yeah, thank you. Good question. Uh, but before I get started with any of these supplies, I have one optional supply for you, and that is a one-sided blade or an X-Acto knife. This was not on the supply list, but we're going to be turning our pencils on their side to create a... Uh... Oh, I've got a weird message on my phone at the moment saying... But it, it looks like, did my screen freeze for you guys? It does look like it's frozen. It appear that it has frozen. It's saying my phone has gotten too hot. I've never seen that happen. The temperature needs to cool down before I can use it. Wow. That's a new one. Um. <laughs> That's quite all right. So while we give your phone a couple of minutes to cool down, we can answer a few more questions about the supplies and the materials. I'm going to drop the materials into the chat so everyone can have those links to the exact supplies that Adrian is using tonight. I'm going to turn off my lights for a second. Maybe my lights were too warm. And we did have a couple people asking about if this would be okay with using pens or digital medium. And I'm of the, of the opinion you have to use graphite for these techniques techniques work tonight. Yes, next week we're going to be talking about uh, some alternative shading techniques using uh, hatching, cross hatching, stippling and scribbling. And for those you can definitely do with a pen or, or anything else. For tonight, you definitely want to use graphite or charcoal uh, to make the tonal shading happen because we're going to be doing a smooth continuous blend and you really can't achieve that with a pen unfortunately, even though pens are one of my preferred drawing mediums, I uh, just can't do the tonal shading with a pen. It looks like I'm back in business here. That is so strange. I have never <laughs> had that happen before to my phone. Um, that's all right. That's the fun part of doing live classes. Yeah, exactly. If happen. it's going to happen, it's going to happen in a live class. Um, okay, so I turned off my light. Is that still pretty well lit without my, my warm light? I think so. One moment. Let me find your top down and I will spotlight it. Oh, to spotlight me. Gotcha. Okay, so with the one-sided blade or an X-Acto knife, I'm just gonna show you how to sharpen your pencil with the blade. And what that's gonna do is give you a much longer exposed piece of graphite to work from so that we can have an easier uh, tool for creating our ground in just a moment. So if you're not familiar with sharpening a pencil with a blade, I'm going to show you how to do that. I'm going to use my 6B or my 4B. I'm just looking for that one. Here's my 6B. Okay. How is the lighting? I'm going to just sac sacrifice that shadow that's happening for not burning up my phone again. Okay, so when you're using a blade, it's always about safety first. So you want to have a cup to grab your extra pieces of shavings that are going to come off when you sharpen the pencil this way. You're not sharpening the graphite itself with the blade. You're basically whittling down, you're taking the wood off of, off of the pencil to expose a longer amount 
of the graphite. So we want to aim to have at least an inch or an inch and a half of the, the graphite showing or exposed. So I'm going to start pretty far back on the pencil here and my shavings might fly across my desk and not into the cup and that's okay. I'm going to do long shallow cuts and I'm cutting away from myself the entire time. So I'm saying long shallow, shallow, shallow cuts, but at the same time, I'm trying to do it quickly. So I kind of cut a little too deep there. So I'm gonna take my own advice and take my time. This does take a minute. It doesn't happen super quickly. You've gotta be patient with this process. And as a reminder, we did not include this uh, the knife on the supply list, this is just an extra demonstration of a technique that can be used to achieve that long graphite point. Correct, yeah. So optional if um, you don't have the woodless graphite or if you just want a tech, if you've seen this before and wondered how artists get this much of their, their pencil exposed, this is how it's done. So. Just remember safety first, point it away from yourself. Don't ever face it towards you when you're cutting. I just have to mention that from my high school teaching days, I used to always make my students sign a little contract with me about the safety of using a blade in the classroom. So the other reason you wanna keep your cuts nice and shallow is because again, you don't wanna cut into the graphite itself. Um, we're not sharpening the graphite itself this way. We're going to use the sanding block for that. So we're just getting the wood out of the way. And it should be pretty soft once you get past the initial um, encasing on the, the wood of the pencil. Also, don't put your finger down there near the blade like I just did, <laughs> pointing at it. Um, but once you get past this level of the wood, it's going to be pretty soft wood, and it, it's really easy to whittle it down. And you can use any sharp knife. It doesn't necessarily have to be. Um, if you're pretty handy with a pocket knife, that'll work just fine. And then, yeah, like I said, once we get that much exposed, We're not actually sharpening, I'm just getting the wood off of there. So that's more than an inch or an inch and a half. Now I've got lovely shavings everywhere. But now I can take my sanding block and I can sharpen that down to a nice fine point. There are lots of benefits to sharpening your pencil this way in addition to having all of, all of this graphite exposed, you're not gonna have to sharpen your pencil as often. You're gonna get more out, more use out of each pencil. Uh, what else? You can get a lot of different variations with your lines as you're drawing, and it definitely helps with the tonal shading to be able to get like a nice, smooth, soft blending going. Adrian, um, can you remind us what number pencil that is that you're using? I'm using a 6B. Okay, so you don't have to sharpen all of your pencils that way before we get started here, but maybe just one. Um, and if you don't have a blade and you want to just save that, put that tip in your back pocket for later, then do that. But uh, I wanted at least one pencil to be sharpened that way for when I make um, the ground in just a moment. So I wanted to get that done. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do here is create a value scale using tonal shading. So I'm going to set my still life item off to the side and have all of my sketching pencils there and ready. So we're going to draw a long skinny rectangle in your sketchbook. I'm going to just the one that I just sharpened here. So we're going to draw a long skinny rectangle to create a value scale. So value is the, the light and dark that we have in the artwork. So our lights and our darks. And we talk about this in terms of a scale from zero to 10. I'm going to be referring throughout this dr drawing series 
after this class. I may not always stop to say what what I mean at every point. Um, once I get into more advanced classes, sometimes I forget to explain this again, but uh, I'll often refer to my lightest lights as my zeros, my ones, my twos, the brightest highlights that I see in um, a reference photo or a still life or whatever I'm working from and when I'm speaking about value. And then when I'm talking about the darkest darks, the darkest part of a shadow, I'll say the, the tens, the eights, the nines. So think of a scale from zero to 10. So zero being your absolute white, or if you were working with a pen, it would be your blank paper, or if you're working on white paper, it would be your blank paper. If we were working on toned paper, which we will do later on in this series, then you would be doing your absolute white with a white chalk pastel or um, white pencil. And then our absolute 10 is going to be the solid black or absolute black. And then you don't have to label them all the way one through 10. You may not even necessarily have exactly 10 different values on your scale. You just want to think in terms of your darkest dark and your lightest light and then have a medium in the middle. So your value scale may not be as nice and neat as mine, but we just want to um, have a sense of this tonal shading from light to dark. So. Last week we talked all about those H and B pencils. The H pencils are going to be used for our lighter values, and the B pencils are going to be used with our for our darkest values. So think about that scale from H to B, with the highest number on the H side being the lightest, and the highest number on the B side being the darkest. And that's what we're going to use to create our value scale. So our darkest pencil in this. This 12 pencil set is a 6B, I believe. Um, last week, I misspoke when I said that an 8B was the darkest pencil I had seen. There are 10B pencils out there. They're just a little harder to find, but someone actually emailed me after the class and sent me a link to buy a 10B pencil. So I appreciate that if that person is here again tonight. That was fun. Uh, so I'm using the 6B to do my, my absolute black here. So, and again, last week we talked about holding the pencil to get the most out of it, holding it towards the back, holding it parallel to the paper and uh, not putting so much pressure on it. So that's exactly what I'm doing here. And if I know a lot of you, there's a lot more people tonight than we had last week. So definitely go back and watch the, the class from last week on introduction to graphite and drawing forms. If I had time to go back into all of that, I would tonight, but I want to zip it along here. So I'm just going to keep referring to that first class a little bit and not telling you everything that was in it. Um, but we're going to do a nice, circular, even, smooth tone. So the word tone, think about tone in music is it's a continuous thing. So we want it to be nice and continuous. If you can see any paper showing through, you're not at an absolute solid black, right? So we need to get it solid black, no paper showing through there. We're using this smooth, continuous tonal shading. And then I'm going to start to pull up on my pressure a little bit and keep blending down to a medium dark. I'm going to keep dragging it down. I'm going to try to get to a five really quick just by letting up on my pressure. So I know I made that look super easy by holding my pencil this way to get the most out of it. And I've got a lot of my graphite shown. So that's definitely the benefit of sharpening your pencil that way. But if you did it with, so here's the 6B of the woodless graphite pencil that was in that kit that I recommended in the supply list. Uh, the Artist Loft 101, I think is the, the name of the kit that was linked in the supply list. 
has a couple of woodless graphite pencils in them. Those are also really great for turning on their side on the side and getting a nice smooth tone going. So you can switch to your 4B or your 2B at some point, your 3B as you start to blend from dark to medium dark to medium. And then I'm going to switch to my HB or my 2B to start to get my, my lighter side going, just so that there's a little bit of the B side of pencils coming into our lighter values. And then I'll switch to my H pencils. And like I said, the higher we go on the H pencils, when the numbers get higher, the pencil is becoming lighter, it's becoming harder, um, and those are what you're going to use for your lighter values. So my H is going to be a little bit darker than my 2H. My uh, 2H is going to be a little bit darker than my 3H, etc. But I definitely want to keep my pencil on its side for this. holding it towards the back of the pencil and watching my pressure to get those lighter values to happen. I'm gonna switch to my 4H for my three, two, and one, because I want those to be nice and light, like a little baby's breath on the page, because we want our one to be just a little bit darker than blank paper. Are there any questions up until this point? I'm seeing a lot of stuff on the chat, but it's a little too much to, to look at. Maddie, are there any reoccurring questions to mention at this point? Yeah, we've had a few questions. Some people only have one or two pencils and they don't have all the different levels of hardness. And okay. they're wondering if they can still achieve this scale. Yeah, you could definitely achieve this with uh, just one or two pencils. Even if you've just got your HB and your 2B, just go use your, 2B on the darker side and uh, use your HB on the lighter side and just try to watch your pressure. So on the B side, you're definitely going to be putting more pressure, but you want that pressure to be smooth and continuous and even. So as you let up on your pressure, make sure you're doing that gradually and then switch to your HB in the middle and then just light lighter and lighter pressure. And I think it's easier to start with the dark, darker values and then let up on pressure than it is to try to go light and then add pressure. It seems like a lot of us tend to be a little more heavy handed and it's easier to go dark and then let up on the pressure. Uh, the next thing I want to do is um, talk about rendering a sphere really quick here, but I'm also aware of the time and I wanted to move on to creating our ground pretty soon. So I'm going to do just a quick little sketch uh, of using this tonal shading to create a sphere. And once again, if you missed last week uh, and you're struggling to sketch a circle, or if your circle is not looking very spherical and it's looking kind of flat as you add the shading to it, go back and watch last week because we talked about all the best practices to help you achieve a nice uh, perfect-ish circle and also how to follow contour lines. So I'm gonna put a little sun right here. I'm imagining that my light source is coming from the top left and so that's going to create a shadow on the bottom right. And then, like we talked about last week, we want our shadow to hug the curves of the sphere. So we're looking for a C curve. And we want that curve to really follow the contours of a sphere. And we really spent a lot of time last week talking about contour lines how to 
see those, observe them, and follow them when we're rendering three-dimensional forms. So I'm using that, I'm using a six, the 6B again. And yeah, look how much usage I can get out of it with sharpening that way. It just lasts a long time and you can get a lot of different variety of marks to happen with it like this because we can turn it on its side. I can change the direction. Um, but I'm adding my shadow in a C curve here, making sure that those, that dark value is hugging the contours of the form. So the sphere is curved all the way around. So I need my, my values to curve all the way around, but I'm keeping my, my value smooth and continuous. It's tonal shading, and I'm just using my 6B here just to zip it along, and I'm just watching my pressure. So I'm just letting up on my pressure as I go. And I'm going to go back in and add some really dark pressure here to the edge to get that value to be nice and dark at the edge of the circle. And then remember, we talked about an oval shape last week to achieve that that curve all the way around at the top of the sphere. I'll switch to my an H pencil for the lighter values here, but I'm still keeping my blending smooth, continuous. These little circles really achieve that, that blended tonal shading. Okay. And then your, your shadow can use some nice diagonal lines to just fill that in. Adrian, we had a good question about holding the pencil further back and how that is affecting how dark or how much you can control the darkness of it. Okay, yeah, that was, um, I know I keep referring to last week's class. Um, we spent a lot of time last week talking about just holding the pencil a specific way when it comes to art pencils. Uh, if you're holding your art pencil like this, it's really hard to control the pressure that you're putting on it. You really wanna hold your pencil towards the middle or the back. And if that feels weird to you, then uh, really notice the pressure that you're putting on it. It's really difficult to hold it that way and not put a lot of pressure on it. So when I hold it back like this, um, the movement that I'm making as I draw is really coming more from my arm and not my wrist. And so it, it's much easier to cover a large amount of the paper or a large amount of whatever I'm drawing when I hold it this way because my just dexterity is a lot more fluid when I'm drawing with the effort coming from my arm and not my wrist. So yeah, class number one was very informative since I ref keep referring to it so much. All right, so I want to move on to drawing with a ground because the name of the class is tonal shading with and without a ground, but I just wanted to make sure that we talked about what tonal shading is, how to achieve the full value scale from light to dark using tonal shading. Next week, we'll be talking about hatching and cross hatching. It'll be part one of two uh, in those alternative shading techniques. So tune in next week for that. But tonight, we're just talking about tonal shading. So we're going to do something that looks like this uh, with our still life item. But first, we want to create that ground. So what is a ground? Ground that we stand on is all one surface, typically, and like a layer of something. So we're creating a tone or a ground. It's oft, it's referred to as, as a tone sometimes too. So if you have the woodless graphite, if you have a graphite stick, that'd be great as well. Whatever you do, you're going to turn it on its side and we're just going to blend down 
the surface of the paper using the side of your pencil. So that's why the more of a pencil you have exposed, the better. You want to use a darker B, maybe your 4B or your 6B. If you're using the 6B, try not to put too much pressure. You're looking for a medium tone or a medium ground here. So not quite our darkest dark on that value scale, but somewhere in the middle here. And if you've got a lot of streaky lines showing up, try to go back over those and get them to be as smoothly blended as possible. If they're still there, you can take your tissue or maybe even one of your blending stumps and do a nice little circular motion to blend it together. If it got too dark, you can erase some out. If you made it too light when you rubbed it with the tissue or paper towel, you can put some in and do that again. Any questions at this point? We did have one question. Uh, from Pamela, she's wondering, in your first example, you left a little white sliver in between the drop shadow and the sphere. Oh, yes. Thank you for mentioning that. So yeah, just when a, a, a object is sitting on the surface of anything and we've got light cast across it, there's usually going to be a little moment where you've got the darkest shadow at the edge of the object and a little space between that and the, the shadow called the reflective light. Um, so it's nice to leave that there. Uh, it's not always, you don't always see reflective light, but whenever I'm doing just kind of a dummy version of a, a sphere like that, the typical diagram that you might see if you Google, you know, drawing a sphere, you're gonna, they'll be labeled with the, the highlight, the tone, the mid-tone, um, shadow and then the reflective light that happens there. So that's just my little academia brain creeping in there. But when you're looking at your still life object, you might not have a sliver of reflective light. Okay, so I've got a nice, smooth, continuous ground going. Um, I have to be a little bit of a snob here when it comes to tonal shading and talking about blending because a lot of beginners do something that you maybe just did just then or you might be tempted to do and that is blend it with your finger if you don't have a tissue handy and uh, as an art teacher with lots of art teacher friends I used to teach at the public school level I know there are lots of professional art teachers who disagree with me on this and here I am on Michael's saying, I don't like blending with fingers, but here's why. Your fingers have oils in them. And like, you know, I'm a little nervous when I'm teaching in front of a class this large sometimes. My fingers probably have some, some clamminess to them right now. And if I were to rub the graphite with my finger, I'm gonna end up with, you know, the oils in my fingers coming out onto my drawing and you don't want that. And also the other reason is for beginner's sake, if you're trying to give yourself enough room to grow and evolve as an artist, really focus on making the blending happen with the graphite itself. Use the pencils and the tools to make this gradual shift from light to dark or dark to light happen in your drawing. When you smudge it with your finger, sometimes it tends to smudge it all around and people tend to lean on that, uh, that blurriness, that effect that happens a little too much sometimes and they don't do the work to actually blend and make that shift happen with the pencils. You can do it with the pencils and you can blend with the, the blending stumps, you can take a tissue, and if you really like the effect that you get with your finger because it's pointed and you can get more, you know, uh, control, you feel like you have more control over what you're blending, you can, you know, twist a paper towel up if you don't have a, a blending stump or a tortillion. So there are options, and I will gladly 
speak to any comments about why you think blending with your finger is great. <laughs> Come at me. Just kidding. Um, we had a few questions on that background. Um, we saw okay. you use two different pencils. One was the 6B. What was the other one that you drew with? I was also using the 6B, but I was use, using the woodless graphite. I guess I had an 8B and a 6B. Um, I was kind of switching between the woodless graphite and the, the 6B uh, sketching pencil. And then you just use a tissue to rub it into the page? Yeah, yeah just the tissue. And I did that a few times. Okay, so now I'm going to take my eraser, either my kneaded eraser or my synthetic eraser. Since a few people are missing the kneaded eraser, I'll start with the synthetic one. And I'm looking at my lemon, from whatever still life item you have there, and I'm looking at my lightest lights. Now I'm going to erase out my lightest lights. So what's so great about a ground like this is that it's like training wheels on what we're doing because if especially when talking about blending with your finger a lot of times what the, you're doing when you're blending with your finger is that you're smearing everything all around and it kind of camouflage what's really going on there in the drawing so the the tone or the ground can also do that um it also we already have our medium values here so all we really need to focus on in the initial drawing phase here is just our lightest lights and our darkest darks. So I'm putting in my lightest highlights. I'm gonna to switch to the kneaded eraser just cause I can blend a little more with it into the ground as I erase out my lightest values. Um, so I'm looking at all the, the big highlights that I'm seeing on my lemon there. I'm gonna do this a few times. So. That's not going to be the first time that I erase out those highlights. I mean, it was the first time. It's not going to be the last time <laughs> that I erase out those highlights. I'm going to erase them out and put them back in a few times. And then now I'm looking at my darkest darks. So my light is coming from over here. My light is right here. So it's hitting the lemon from the bottom and my shadow is over here and my shadow is being cast that direction. So look at yours, see where your shadow is being cast in your, your still life item. I'm gonna use a diagonal line to fill in my shadow using the tonal shading, but I'm just making sort of a, a layer up using a diagonal line that I'm shading all the way across. And it's easy to do when I've got my pencil sharpened like that, I know. Um, and so you're gonna switch through a lot of different pencils, play around with all your different H's and B's here as you blend. And this is a really forgiving way to draw. So use all your different B's and H's and just start to get your, your values going. And if something doesn't look quite right, or if you feel like the shape of it is wrong or whatever, erase it out and start again. I mean, this is such a great way to begin drawing because like I said, it's very forgiving. You can add it, take it out, this additive and subtractive way of working uh, I think is is very forgiving. I'm going to use a tortillion to to blend here in some places. And I know I'm working kind of quickly here, mainly just because I want to have a product that's close to the example that I had for the class before I move on to doing the tonal shading without a ground. I'll move on to that in about five minutes here. But I want you to take your time as you do this. So this may take, you know, if you have the time to put an hour into it, each one, the tonal uh, shading with and without a ground, 
really take your time adding and subtracting the graphite here and playing around with layers because the more you erase it out and put it back in, the more you're going to start to achieve something that looks like this. I would say when I was sketching this, this lemon, I probably erased and drew the lemon again, maybe 10 times. And that's how I started to get that sort of ethereal effect to happen. And I have been drawing a long time and I do have lots of practice behind me to be able to do that with 10 layers of it. It maybe will take you 20 to get something like that to start to happen. But the more you do that, <clears throat> the more practice you're gonna get and the more you're gonna start to render something that feels really three-dimensional. So don't be afraid to let go of your drawing and draw it again. And I think the more you erase it out and put it back in, the more the, the blended layers just start to mix together and start to really feel three-dimensional. Um, and I'm following the contours of the form the whole time. Last week, I spent a lot of time talking about uh, following that curve, like I was just mentioning with the sphere. So make sure as you're putting the value on, you're hugging the, the curves, following the elevational lines of your lemon. I am switching to adding a few darker lines here, just where I'm seeing some details happen. Also look for imperfections in your lemon. We also talked a lot about that last week with our still life items and how the more unique we make a still life item look like putting in little dents or bruises or, or scratches that show up in a piece of fruit, the more it's gonna be recognized as a piece of fruit because fruit is not always perfectly shaped one way. Okay, I'm getting ready to move on to the tonal shading without a ground, but before I do, just want to repeat how important it is to be patient with this process. If yours is not feeling three-dimensional right away, erase those highlights back out, put them back in, really play around with using this tone to your advantage to softly blend your, your tonal shading. And yeah, use everything that you got. Use those tortillions, the tissue. If you use your finger, just don't tell me about it. Any questions about that before I move on to shading without a ground? Taking the training wheels off. There's not too many questions. A lot of, a, a few people are saying that they're feeling this is a little fast, but I do want to remind everyone that you can go back and watch the recording tomorrow. And a lot of the skills that she's glossing over are things that were brought up in the first class, which the recording is available. And I'll drop that in the chat for you to go back and reference. Yeah, definitely. Um, typically when I teach something like this, it would be, you know, like in a three hour long class. And in the first hour of the class, we would cover what we covered last week and then we'd be moving on to this. But with just an hour to cover things, we're, we're breaking it up into these bite-sized pieces. So definitely check out last week's class. I know I've referenced it quite a bit. And next week, I'm sure I'll be referencing this one quite a bit. So hopefully you guys will join me next week. Okay, so the ground, like I said, gives you those mid-tones and makes it a little bit easier to achieve that smooth tonal blending because the medium tones are already there. And so you're already starting with something and you're erasing out your highlights, you're adding your, your shadows, you're putting shadows back in, you're erasing highlights back out, you're doing that whole process multiple times until you achieve what you're going for there. Without the ground, 
it might be a little bit harder. So I wanted to show you how to do it with the ground first, even though it maybe seemed like the more advanced technique. Some people might consider that one a little more advanced. I think it's a makes it a little bit easier. Shading without the tone means we've got to do all of that blending ourselves. We don't have the mid-tone already there to help us achieve the, the mid-tones. So if your hands are super messy after that, you might want to wipe them off a little bit like I'm going to. Okay, so I'm going to do without the ground now. And I'm going to start out with, I'm going to use my 6B just because I want you to be able to see my lines on the screen. And I'm afraid they won't show up if I start with the H pencil. But again, like we talked about last week, you want to use an H pencil or a, a lighter pencil for your initial sketch lines so that they are easy to erase in case, excuse me, the first thing that you, uh, you draw is not exactly like you want it to look so that you'll be able to erase those lines. It's better to use your lighter pencil. But I'm going to start with my darker pencil just so that you can see what I'm doing. And I'm going to sketch my basic outline of my, my lemon. So this time I'm really having to think about those contour lines. The contours are all of the surface of a form. So they are the every surface of the form, not just the outer lines of the form, but every curve or elevational shift that's happening on every surface of the form. So last week we all drew this, this apple with all of these contour lines. So I'm thinking about that as I'm sketching my lemon and I'm adding, I'm going to kind of map out all of these various values. So I'm thinking about my value scale from 10, from zero to 10, and I'm blocking off the, the shape, the organic shape of the shadow that's happening here in my darkest shadow. It doesn't go all the way to a 10, but it's still the darkest shadow that I'm seeing on the lemon and it makes an irregular shape sort of like this. So I sketched that in, I sketched in this uh, where the, the stem was on the lemon. And then I'm also going to sketch in any imperfections that I'm seeing just to help anchor myself as I'm sort of mapping out the different points on the lemon. All right, and then my shadow is going that direction. And then as I start, so I again like to start with the darkest shadows and then let up on pressure and go to my lightest values. If you would prefer to start with the lighter values and start with your H pencils and begin to shade lightly and then build on the shadows, you can. Uh, the best thing about using light pressure is that if you add even a dark value with very light pressure, it hasn't quite become embedded into the paper yet and it should be easy to erase if you're not putting a lot of pressure. So if I shade with very light pressure like that by holding it towards the back of the pencil, should still be able to erase that completely or mostly, um, but just saying, it's all about that pressure that you're putting on the pencil. So I like to start with the darker values and then work my way towards the lighter ones, but it's, it's up to you how you want to do it. And I know throughout these classes and throughout when I'm teaching, any class, I always have to stop myself at some point and make sure that when I say certain things like that, as far as my preferences, it's my preference. So I'm not saying you should always start with the darker 
shadows and work your way towards the lighter values, you find what works for you. I love to tell people that are just starting out in their artistic journey that being a beginner artist is like dating yourself because when you're first dating someone you're finding out what they they like what they don't like what their preferences are what annoys them etc right and you maybe don't know what your favorite pencil is to use or you don't know if you prefer a kneaded eraser or a synthetic eraser you don't know what your favorite sketching paper is so you have to date yourself a little bit in your artistic practice and figure out what those things are. So if you want to pick up on my preferences and use those, fine. If you find something that works better for you, by all means, do it that way. Because innovation is where creativity happens. There's always a different way. Okay, so I'm following the contours of the form using that smooth, continuous, blended technique. I'm gonna switch to a lighter pencil so I can get my lighter values going here. And this maybe is not happening immediately for you as you're sketching yours, it's maybe not coming together as smoothly as mine so far. So if that's the case, the less pressure you're putting on these values, the easier they would be to erase and go back in and try again. But I challenge you to not give up and just keep going because sometimes we can get really frustrated with a drawing process not happen happening immediately and you know, start over on a different piece of paper or throw it away or just give up altogether. And if we had just kept practicing, maybe the breakthrough was, was right about to happen. The learning curve tends to be straight for a long time before it shoots, you know, up into a curve, right? So don't give up on yourself and keep going with your practice until something starts to look like a lemon. Any questions at this point? Not seeing too many questions. Or any comments worth discussing? We're seeing a lot of positive comments. People are really liking the contour sketching technique. Okay, and um, the class overall in general, people are really liking this result. Okay, awesome. Yeah, and I know I maybe felt a little rushed through the shading with the ground. I was just trying to get to the, the second part here before we ran out of time. Um, but now I'm slowing down because I'm realizing we're almost out of time and I covered everything. So if anybody has any comments or questions or anything at this point, I'd love to, to hear them. Um, also, I'd love to see what you guys have drawn if you want to hold up your your sketch uh, with your ground or without the ground. And also, I'm curious which one you like better and maybe why. What do you think doing them both ways? I'll spotlight like a few people. We have some people holding up their pieces. I'll hold them. Okay, nice. Oh, yeah, that's great. And you got a little reflective light there. Oh, look at those delicate little cherries. Very nice. We have, takes just a second to click through. Got another lemon there. Lovely. Okay. Yeah, I'm seeing lots of smooth tonal blending happening. Oh, look at that, it's a cool smiley face. Very nice. Sorry, I can't go through every single person. We have so many people on our class tonight. This is so wonderful. Well, definitely, if we didn't get a chance to spotlight you, uh, post it on your Instagram or Twitter or wherever you like to share your art and tag it with 
make it with Michael's or Michael's classes, or you can even tag me on Instagram uh, at Adrian Hodge Art, and you can. I'd love to see your work. Um, we still have five minutes here, so I'll keep keep working on mine. Um, yeah, and I wanted to mention about like adding details like this. So on this example that I had for the class, there's a few spots here where I really took the time to put the little the little grain that I'm seeing on the the lemon rind. So I didn't do that on the entire drawing. I just did it right there near the highlight. And so in the area where the highlight is, I used my um, probably 2B or a lighter H. Adrian, can you tell us about what you'll be teaching next week? Yes. Um, so we covered tonal shading tonight, and then next week will be part one in a two-part little series on alternative shading techniques. So hatching, cross-hatching, stippling, and scribbling. So next week we'll be talking about hatching and cross-hatching only. And we'll be keeping uh, the theme of still life items. So an organic still life item. So leaves, flowers, fruit. Uh, the smaller, the better, honestly, just so that we can have an end result by the end of the class. So if you want to go out into, you know, the garden and just find some interesting leaves or maybe some rocks or something organic, uh, flower petals, it doesn't even have to be an entire flower, just something organic and we'll be practicing the uh, hatching and cross hatching techniques only. Um, and we'll do the same thing that we did tonight with the, the value scale, and we'll take our time to break down hatching and cross hatching, and then we'll, we'll shade our still life items with those. But we'll also spend some time talking about the same thing that we talked about last week and this week a little bit as well, and that is uh, following the contours of a form. So the differences between that on this flower petal would be making our value go with straight lines here on on this flower petal, maybe might make it appear flat. But whenever I follow the curve that's happening on the flower petal, then it starts to feel more rounded and uh, curved like the surface of the form. So like I said, we're building on the same skills from last week and just continuing on, but just covering some different techniques, talking about contour lines, rendering forms and the various shading techniques that we can use for that. And next week, if you don't have graphite, you can definitely do hatching and cross hatching with a pen or a charcoal, but I'll be using uh, graphite next week as well. So pretty much the same supplies, uh, only we won't be using the tortillions or the blending techniques because we'll be doing hat, we'll be doing all our blending with hatching and cross hatching. But yeah, your tortillion comes in very handy once you get those. Uh, this is why I challenge you to do it with just the pencils because if I had leaned on blending with the blending stump a little too soon, I might be tempted to just kind of smear the graphite that I already have on the paper around rather than actually blending those those tones themselves. But here when I blended it, it kind of got a little too dark, but that's when I can come in with my kneaded eraser and sort of do this eraser blending action. So I'm erasing and I'm blending at the same time. And I'm doing that in a circular motion so that I'm keeping that smooth, continuous flow going. And you can also designate your different dortillions for different values so that you're using this one for lighter values and this one for darker values that way it's not getting stained with a darker b pencil and you can use it to blend on your lighter values as well all right i think i covered everything i wanted to and we're right at seven o'clock thank you guys so much i really enjoyed it um and hope i'll see you next week